Dementia Researcher podcast, talking careers, research, conference highlights, and so much more. Hello, and thank you for joining us for our fourth and final AAIC Highlights podcast. Yes, I know there is one more day of conference, but we swamped you enough with news all this week, so we thought we'd give you a break tomorrow. I'm Adam Smith, I'm the Programme Director for Dementia Researcher, and it's my delight to be sitting in the host chair today, again. Today, as per the rest of the week, we'll be sharing a snapshot of some of our best bits from the day's presentations, and weren't there so many today. To bring you highlights, I'm joined by three brilliant researchers. We have Vish Navi, Balandra, Dr. Ian Hartnell, and Dr. Helena Popovic. Hello, everybody. Hello, Adam. Hello. Hi. So let's do some proper introductions. Ian, why don't you go first? Hi, I'm Ian. Um, in a former life, I was a dementia researcher looking at FTD and inflammation. But now I work for the Alzheimer's Society in the UK as a research communications officer. So I basically translate technical research language into words that everybody without a science background can understand. So they know all about the exciting scientific advances that happen in dementia research. Great. Uh, where did you do your PhD? Um, I did my PhD at York, University of York in the UK. Ah, the, so Yorkshire, People's Republic. I'm as a proud Yorkshireman. I'm I'm quite pleased to see that you went to Yorkshire. Yeah, well I so I lived in York for four years and absolutely love York and the surrounding county. It's great. It's probably my favourite county in the UK. So, how soon after finishing your PhD did you jump ship? Um, I did a postdoc after my PhD in Southampton, and then uh, following that postdoc, I started Alzheimer's Society. Well, well done. It's a great place to work, I imagine. I, I mean, not that I work there, but I, I work with. They're great. Um, Helena, what are you going next? I'm a general medical doctor, a health educator and author of three books, two of them related to dementia risk reduction. And I teach patients, the public and health professionals, evidence-based strategies to boost their brain and reduce the risk of cognitive decline and dementia. So I depend on all you brilliant researchers to provide me with essential information to pass on to my patients and colleagues. And I'm very excited that on my return to Australia, I'll be investigating whether a ketogenic diet can reduce cognitive decline in people with either type 2 diabetes, subjective cognitive impairment or mild cognitive impairment. And I can't help but think that uh, Australians and their love of avocado will have uh, far less trouble with the keto diet than some other places in the world. Well, I'm I'm go low. I'm low carb anyway, and I've tried the ketogenic diet. I did it when my partner had lung cancer because it uh, facilitates uh, augments the effectiveness of chemo and radiotherapy, and it wasn't that hard. It's just about planning and knowing what to do. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for joining us. And V, I'll come to you next. Hi, my name is Vishnavi, but it's V for short, and I'm a medical student pursuing dementia research. Um, I take a more integrative uh, medicine approach, so my research is on non-farm interventions as well as pharmacological interventions. So I focus on diet, exercise, lifestyle changes, um, health and wellness um, that may help to prevent and treat AD. And um, I also... I'm part of the Alzheimer's Association as a student representative for the Nutrition, Metabolism, Dementia PIA, as well as the Clinical Trials PIA. And uh, anybody who wants to know more about the PIAs, all last week we did a PIA podcast each day on our Relay podcast, which we talked about the PIAs and their work, and they do an amazing contribution to bring people together. So thank you very much, V, not only for being here, but also for all that voluntary work you do with the PIAs. That's brilliant. So... I know that none of our speakers have been presenting at this conference today, so we're going to get straight on with the highlights. Helena, why don't you go first? This was actually the last uh, presentation of the day. It was definitely one of my highlights, though everything was brilliant. And it was um, implementation of plasma biomarkers in clinical practice. Now, the whole conference has been all about biomarkers, but this particularly impressed me because it was um, Henrik Zetterberg, from Clinical Neurochemistry Lab in Salgrenska University Hospital, Sweden. I apologise if the pronunciation was incorrect. And he looked at the um, potential co-founders in interpreting Alzheimer's disease blood biomarkers. Um, and it just made the whole topic of biomarkers even more complicated than I realised it would be. I mean, we know that age, kidney function, like creat creatinine levels and BMI, do influence um, NFL, um, GFAP, 
and to a lesser extent PTAL, but not to a great extent. However, um, firstly, they found that individual drugs that a patient may be taking can have really strong effects, like um, a tetracycline antibiotic used to treat pneumonia called minocycline. It also affects microglial activity, and so it increases plasma NFL several fold. So that would result in a false positive. Um, there's also a hypertensive drug used in heart failure. It decreased plasma amyloid beta 42 to 40 ratio by 30%, which is actually greater than that caused by amyloid plaque pathology. So that would be another false positive. Um, and then there was a, a chronic myeloid leukemia drug that also reduced P tau after 12 months of treatment. So number one, we've got to be really careful on what other drugs the patient is on. And the other really interesting finding was that a standardized meal reduced plasma NFL, GFAP and PTAL by 10 to 20% after two hours. And that's similar to the reduction um, seen in anti-amyloid beta anti antibody drug trials. So it's it definitely seems we're gonna need fasting samples. So basically the takeaway from that was, be on the lookout for confounding factors. If you have really unusual, unexpected results when you're doing a biomarker test, look at, really start to investigate what else could be in play with that patient. So we need to keep looking for unknown factors that influence biomarkers and can either give false positives or false negatives. That is interesting, isn't it? Because that, well, and that's, there's some of the big questions that I think this, this new grant, there's a funding call open in the UK at the moment for five million pounds to test out the practical application and right. use of blood-based biomarkers and you'd imagine that that's got to be a hot topic for those as well, knowing how does it have to be fasted, what are the drugs are going to uh, how how do we capture and understand what are the drugs? Because I can't imagine that they even know yet, even though we've been talking about blood biomarkers for a decade, that they there is a full comprehensive understanding of what other other no drugs uh, will affect this and until some, we some start using them on scale. Yeah, and some co-founders may be assay specific, so there's still a lot more to learn. Did you see that session as well, Ian? I did, yeah. I it showed me that there were some things that I never even imagined could affect plasma tau concentrations. I know that um, Henrik was saying that the ratio, they don't know if the ratio was also affected and whether it's just the pure concentrations, but um, seeing that and seeing how other diseases can also impact. So I think um, kidney diseases quite often impact the reliability yeah. of these markers too. It's just things that I'd never even thought about before. And I'm very glad that there are people out there that are thinking about these stuff, this stuff. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. And that ties in nicely, actually, with the there was a press release from Alzheimer's Association today, which talked about the promise of this finger prick test as a way to um, quickly and easily potentially test for amyloid at, at home, um, uh, rather like people do for um, diabetes at the moment. This was um, Hannah Hoob also from Gothenburg, so I'm guessing she's probably connected to Henrik, I imagine, and Sebastian, Sebastian Blanc is from Lund. Um, they had results from a single fingerprint blood test were promising and um, a blood test that was more than 80% accurate in identifying Alzheimer's related changes, which was significantly better than the doctors who didn't have access to the test. If, I guess if all you're relying on is manual cognitive testing, which we know it's only in the UK. I mean, once you've got your diagnosis anyway, you're discharged, you're discharged that from healthcare. You might come back for titration to manage your drug. Other than that, you come back if things get worse. Um, being able to monitor, continuously monitor your onset, particularly, I guess, also if you're going to be taking a new a treatment, uh, being able to do that through one of these home testing kits yeah. has lots of potential. There was another presentation also on that topic on uh, comparing the accuracy of blood biomarkers and clini clinicians. Um, and clinicians, it was something quite shocking that 50%, I think, of true Alzheimer's disease cases are not receiving symptomatic treatment and 30% of non-Alzheimer's disease cases are incorrectly receiving symptomatic Alzheimer's disease treatment. So it's a big deal. The diagnosis is still pretty poor in clinical practice. Yeah, absolutely. There's a stat, I, know, I think Alzheimer's, I think this has come from Alzheimer's Society, actually, that 30% of diagnosis in the UK is inaccurate anyway. 
So not only, <laughs> not only it's not good enough that we just got to push for improved act for improved diagnosis, but then you've got to get it right as well with so many misdiagnoses out there. I mean, that's not necessarily to say they don't have some form of dementia, but it could be mistyping um, or or misunderstanding what somebody's disease is. That's brilliant. Thank you, Helena. I, I mean, we haven't really talked much about blood biomarkers in these highlight podcasts this week. And as I'm not there in person, I don't get a sense of how big a topic, you know, whenever you go, whenever I go to the AIC, there's like a hot thing. There's like a, you know, I remember one year it was, you felt like everything was about microglia or everything was about anti-amyloid. Where where have blood biomarkers sat in that kind of hysteria of there's a lot going on in this space this week? I didn't even know that there were that many different, just tau alone blood biomarkers. And that just emphasises the importance of cracking on with this programme in the UK to understand which tests to use, how you might use them, where they can be applied. Um, And it brings up that tricky, awkward question of screening again, doesn't it? Screening programmes, middle-aged screening programmes, which are so difficult to consider, but inevitably might have to be. Thank you very much, um, Helena. That was fantastic. Uh, Ian, why don't I come to you next? I'm not really going to shift very far from biomarkers. Um, I went to a really good talk by Rosie Watson from the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research in Parkville, Australia. Um, And her talk was about fluid biomarkers in uh, dementia of Lewy bodies. Um, And I think generally, because there's just so much talk about Alzheimer's disease, because we know so much about, like, the vast majority of the most, most people get Alzheimer's disease, people that get dementia um and then the vast majority of funding is in the in alzheimer's disease as opposed to the other ones um i find it really important to think and consider and look at the other types of other diseases that cause dementia and i learned some really interesting things about dob in her talk and some really hopeful things for the future in terms of blood biomarkers um so she was saying that about um 50 of people who are diagnosed with dementia of Lewy bodies in when we were talking about before about misdiagnosis, about 50% of people diagnosed with DLB, before that diagnosis, they had a different diagnosis that was corrected to DLB. Um, I think because she go, went on a bit later on about um, why that could be. Um, and she's also saying that it takes about 200 days more for somebody to get a diagnosis of DLB than Alzheimer's disease, because it's a much more, um, I don't know, more complicated to diagnose it. Um, and she outlined how in the diagnostic co- toolkit that they have for dementia of Lewy bodies, there aren't any um, any markers that actually track the cause of the disease. They're all things like um, EEG, sleep studies, MRIs that sort of uh, downstream effects of the disease rather than earlier markers. And that there is, isn't currently like a good uh, reliable pet tracer for dementia of Lewy bodies. Um, so in sort of bringing hope from that perhaps slightly unnerving picture, um, she was talking about alpha synuclein seeding assays. And these seem to be a sort of assay where you take a patient sample um, and then you put it in with some native uh, alpha synuclein. Um, and it will, the if you have some sort of um, aberrant alpha synuclein, it will start to aggregate and that will be detected. Um, and they found that it was about 9 out of 10 people, so a 90% success rate in detecting dementia of Lewy bodies. Um, and she was saying about how this is a really important step in the diagnosis and early diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, but in the aspect of complicating the field and why some people might have that horrible diagnosis journey where they get misdiagnosed to start with, is that there's so much comorbidity. Um, I think in a previous talk, I'd heard that um, 50% of people with dementia of blue bodies have also either cerebrovascular disease or amyloid beta pathology or tau pathology. So it's very um, rarely, well, it's sort of more just as common to have it purely as it is to have it with something else. Um, and somebody at some point in their talk said comor- comorbid pathology is the rule, not the exception, which I thought was a really interesting thing that we need to consider. But then another thing that um, Rosie talked about in her talk was that people that have tau in their brains as well as alpha synuclein in DLB. Um, so about between 30 and 60% of people also have tau. 
Um, but it reduces diagnostic accuracy if you have tau because it masks some symptoms. Having tau, people that have tau in their brains too have reduced visual hallucinations and reduced motor Parkinsonism, which are like two of the two of the four classic symptoms of DLB. So that could be a big reason why some people get this misdiagnosis. So I just found like this talk taught me a lot about DLB, showed me that there is hope for the future, but that there are also lots of complications that need addressing as well. That is interesting. Do you have any sense of whether this is varies according to where in the world you are as well? Because because in the UK, where the majority of diagnosis happens through uh, psychiatrists um, rather than in neurology, whereas uh, and so we know that there's a kind of standard set test that they have, whereas neurologists tend to get the different people who present with slightly different symptoms in the first place are more likely to be referred to a neurologist than they are a psychiatrist. And I wonder whether neurologists were better at picking up on Lewy bodies than a psychiatrist's were. Um, in which case, maybe I look to V, because I'm guessing in the US, in the States, it's a kind of very much a neurology led service, isn't it? Do, so do you get a sense whether there's a improved diagnostics for Lewy bodies in the States where they have that different clinical focus? Uh, uh, I agree. Yeah. Um, there's more um, focus and there, um, the um, test screening process is much more detailed for Lewy body because we have uh, subcategories within that as well. So whether the, the improved It'd be just a bit interesting to look at how that varies across the world about improved diagnosis from one country. And in Australia, um, Helena, it's, 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 it's different again, isn't it? Is it mostly elderly care physicians that were uh, in secondary care? It's either a geriatrician Some... or a neurologist is most likely to diagnose that. Yeah. So it shouldn't matter, should it? I mean, fundamentally, the the diagnostic you tools you see when a patient comes through the door should be the same, but you just know that neurologists, a neurologist and a psychiatrist and a geriatrician might all take three slightly different approaches mm. to how they deal with that. I found mm. it interesting. Oh, sorry to interrupt. I just found it interesting. Um, somebody in the audience asked a question and, and made the comment that all um, psychiatrists in Germany learn to do lumbar punctures and it's part of their standard treatment. There's no way and a psychiatrist in Australia is ever taught to do a lumbar puncture, for instance. Interesting. Thank you yeah. very much, Ian. That 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 is good. And um, we've actually talked about Louis bodies on the podcast recently. We we did a an Ask Your Mentor podcast last week with somebody that works in DLB blood biomarkers. Um, so go check that out. There, one of the Race Against Dementia fellows, um, V. You've been very patient. Thank you very much for waiting. Why don't you <laughs> no give, us your, give us your first highlight from today. Um, first highlight from today. So this whole process, um, I had um, FOMO the entire conference because I was like, I wanted to go. I couldn't go because I've had, you know, prior obligations. So I've been like following it, uh, following the conference since day one. So initially it was, um, you know, it, the science uh, aspect to it, um, Dr. Rick with the welcome, and then um, we had the Tau P, uh, PET study and that technology, and then we had the clinical trial um, data release from the anti-amyloid um, therapy. And so I think I kind of went to full circle with um, day, uh, day four, which was, you know, um, uh, caregiver burden and for that for me that spoke a lot to me because we do have you know the um, medications and farm treatments but caregivers are the force behind the survival of um, dementia patients and um, they are they're integral to you know um, um, how the patients um, are like living and living their, through their symptoms. But at the same time, um, from, uh, to, uh, I think t it was today's um, uh, talk, it was not a novel approaches to address caregiver burden and stress and it's a session presentation um, with uh, Dr. Glover. And there were two um, sub presentations within that, that I, that really spoke out to me, which was um, um, addressing black caregiver uh, stress. 
and um, there was, uh, I think it was Dr. Brewster who was talking upon that and how she had implemented a six, um, six step program, which works at, um, you know, um, how to take care um, of their, of the, of the family member who's suffering from Alzheimer's disease. But what I liked about it is that in that program, they also try to incorporate self-care. And um, what they found from that study is after the six weeks, um, these uh, black caregivers were, um, they had mastered the skill and they actually, it actually lessened their um, overall stress and burden. So that was very important. And they've tried to now implement that in Jamaica um, as a pilot study. And so, you know, catering to cultural differences there so that they were working on that. And one more thing in that, um, in that you know, sub presentation that I liked, it's um, I think there's something called, um, I think it's called Care Ecosystem in um, UCSF that is um, um, done by the, the university there. And the, uh, what it is, it's, a, it's also a program. And but then it's like it's like a I want to say um, a, a global village to help take care of that patient. And what they found is when you have um, when you have a caregiver, a caregiver is usually in their like, you know, maybe 15 years younger than the um, uh, patient that they're caring for, um, they're also stressed and they probably have their personal health issues. And what they've noticed and, and they're also um, highly likely depressed and um, what they've noticed is um, when caregivers take care of you know severe dementia patients the emergency visits go up so this program has helped to actually see that the, there's been reduction in emergency visits and also um, the program costs like I believe hundred dollars a month but they've seen in the US um, a five hundred dollar reduction in Medicaid claim, uh, claims so it's uh, it's also like helpful because you know taking care of someone with dementia is also very costly. So I found it very interesting that you know um, that this program that they've implemented and it's also some uh, it's occurring within the U.S. right now. Like they've um, some states have adopted a system that it's not only decreasing the amount of emergency visits, um, but it's also decreasing the inappropriate use of uh, medications that caregivers, you know, end up doing. So I thought it was very, um, I thought it was like, for me, like eye opening. It sounds brilliant. I mean, what were the, what were the well-being interventions for the carer that, that they were in the program? Did they say? Um, I, what they, I think it was that the, they also implemented the self care. Um, you know, there was a team that they could call like a helpline if they needed help, you know, and then it would be tri triaged. That's that's what it was, and um, actually the stat is the number uh, needed to treat one potential inappropriate medication was three, and um, uh, so like I thought that was you know um, overall. So if, if you look at the cost of it, like hundred dollars a month, and you're saving five hundred dollars every month, that's pretty good overall. I, I love that care is is being discussed so prominently, particularly at this. I mean, at the AIC as a whole, that hasn't. It's only really in the last few years that CARES found its way onto this particular program, but it's great this year. There's been so many carer and care-related talks. I still think there is one particular aspect that I think is overlooked, because even though we're getting there on carers, um, professional domiciliary care still doesn't seem to seems to be an under-researched area, uh, particularly when it's provided by to people living in their own homes. In the UK, we've got a challenge, whereas about how many of these people there are, how much time they have with with people, um, how much how much training they have, and what they do when they're in somebody's own homes. And that's that. I think that whole field, that whole profession, about the training they get, what is an appropriate of time, what activities, how they interact with somebody when they visit somebody in their own home is really under researched um so i love that this is going on in care i just i'd like to see it carry on into domiciliary care as well care homes have done really well in the last few years we've seen lots of care home research moving towards improved support for uh, for family carers but i think domiciliary and professional care as well could could do with a good look at i'm going fact i'm going to have a trawl through and have a look and see if i can find some posters on that topic 
uh, just to see if there were any. Thank you, V. That was that was great. You know, what? I'll I'll give you all a little break while I pick up on one. So this. Uh, I I don't know if you saw this today, Helena. Um, There was another press release today from Alzheimer's Association which talks about the um, experiencing less bowel movements is associated with cognitive decline. So this was two new studies have identified specific gut gut bacteria associated with increased risk of dementia as well as bacteria that may be neuroprotective. Uh, Previous research has established a connection between the gut microbiome and the community of microorganisms in our digestive tracts and various bodily functions. Um, But these studies were from Dr. Yannick Wadup from UT Health San Antonio and Dr. Sharon Ma from University of Massachusetts Amherst. And they emphasized the interconnection of bodily systems and highlighted the need to address dysfunction for overall health. I'm, I'm I'm going to read this now. So it was the U.S. Pointer study is investigating how behavioral interventions impact behavioral interventions impact the gut brain axis to better understand the relationship between gut bacteria and brain health. Uh, The first study uh, revealed that chronic constipation characterized by infrequent bowel movements is linked to worse cognition, indicating a healthy gut is crucial for brain health. I'm always without seeing the full data on this I, it's one of those ones where i'd really want to see the full data because with that that's got headline written all over it but when you start to scratch below it you find it's that's a an oversimplification of what is clearly a more complex issue so i could see that it's long been known in parkinson's disease that you get um dysregulated bowel function and co- more constipation preceding the disease and and weird studies have found that if you cut the vagus nerve you will reduce your risk of parkinson's disease but no thanks <laughs> well and also uh, we i've talked about this i'm i feel like i'm constantly plugging this podcast we recorded one earlier this week talking about hydration which will come out i think on the 4th of september uh, although I made the connection between hydration and constipation and they all corrected me and said, actually, that's not entirely true. Um, but I always understood that was the case. So listen to that podcast, 4th of September. Um, Elise Parkinson's going to join us from University of East Anglia to hear about them. The second study in this, uh, this highlight was uh, um, suggested a correlation between specific gut bacteria and the buildup of Alzheimer biomarkers providing potential avenues for therapeutic approaches. There was also a third study that looked at low levels of certain gut bacteria were associated with poor cognition, highlighting the importance of maintaining a uh, healthy gut microbiome and diet. Um, I'm not going to talk about this a great deal. We've we've actually done a whole bunch of podcasts on guts and microbiomes and diet and dementia in the past. Um, Sam Moxon's recorded a series for us called Food for Thought, and he had an ama- he's had two um, people that have talked really well to this, which is Alan Desmond um, from the US and Neil Barnard, um, who've been on the podcast to talk about this topic, about different food stuff, some plant-based diets and things. So I, go have a listen to those, or my Helena's books. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I get that plugging for you there. Why don't you, I, while you're there, Helena, why don't you tell us about these two books? Because it sounds like they're relevant to this topic. Very relevant. The, the, the second one, the most recent one, is the more detailed one for health professionals as well as the public. It's called Can Adventure Prevent Dementia? A Guide to Outwitting Alzheimer's. And as well as going through the 12 modifiable risk factors listed in the Lancet report, you know, I go through, you know, sleep, obstructive sleep apnea, um, dental hygiene, the microbiome, um, the importance of meaning and purpose, the importance of time spent in nature, you know, the real important, the importance of the caregiver relationship and to, to change that language to call them a care partner so that you realise that you're getting something out of it as well because our perception of our role is really important. I also talk about the importance of beliefs and attitudes and how our negative stereotypes are really damaging. And when you improve people's perception of ageing, they, you know, it's it's that old adage, if you feel young, you are young, and it actually is borne out in, in a lot of the science. So my both my book, the, the second one goes takes a really deep dive on how to reduce your risk of Alzheimer's, how to best care for somebody with 
dementia. But it, it's, you know, I talk about, you. we've got to start our risk reduction strategies in midlife. It's too, it's not too late, but the longer you leave it, the harder it is. So it's a book for everyone who wants to look after their brain. And the first one was more about, it's called In Search of My Father. Dementia is no match for a daughter's determination. And it was really how the, dis, my journey, learning to be his care partner. So that's more for carers. And, and then getting tips on, on how to manage being thrown into the care, role of caring because it almost seems like you're thrown into it overnight. It, that's how it happened to me. Mum died of lung cancer and there was such a stigma around dementia in my Serbian family of origin that they didn't tell, my parents did not tell their only child, their loving daughter, who was also a doctor, that her father had Alzheimer's. I found out because after mum died, I was clearing out the fridge and I found a bottle, uh, a bottle, a box of river stigmine in the butter compartment of the fridge. And I said to dad, oh, what's this doing here? Who's taking this? He said, I am. I said, why? He said, your mum said I needed to take it for my memory. I don't think it does much good, but, you know, happy wife, peaceful life, so I take it. That is how, and then I went and tracked down dad's GP because I was living interstate. That's how I found out my father had Alzheimer's disease and I realised I've now got to look after this man. Like, I didn't realise that I wasn't going to be able to leave him. So it. So the first book talks about that journey. What a story. Um, I, I need to read that now. Is that available in Waterstones and Amazon and all good Amazon, bookstores? Amazon. They're, they're both available on Amazon, yes. Or through my website, but it's probably cheaper if you get it through Amazon. <laughs> no, go to your website. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alina. That's... That's fascinating and, and a good uh, highlight to pick up on. Ian, we're going to come back to you for your second. Is it your second? I think you're second. Um, mine's not like, second highlight isn't a single talk. It was the closing section of the plenary today. Um, so the plenary was um, speakers from Biogen, Roche, Eli Lilly and Azai, all talking about how the various drugs that they have been testing in clinical trials change biomarkers in... Um, in their participant groups um and for stars they were all very interesting talks but kath mummery did a, a small summary towards the end of it that was looking more towards the future um and she was saying how we're right now we're in a an era of amyloid immunotherapy um but we've got more to do we need to keep our foot to the uh, step on the gas she said we need to step on the gas um and not take our feet off um because explaining how early diagnosis is important to get people el eligibility for these drugs um, we need to have the provision of scalable mark biomarkers that can detect and then um, and then segregate out uh, different uh, participant groups, um, as well as improving service implementation for how people will actually get these drugs. Um, but then following that, there was a really interesting mini question session because I didn't attend. I wasn't. I'm virtual, so I'm still in the UK, and I didn't. They didn't have the main Q&A section virtually. It was only um, for people in, in the room. Um, but they did a couple of questions and they were both really interesting because the first question was, how do we go now from knowing that decreasing amyloid beta improves clinical benefit? What things, extra learnings do we have to understand? Um, so they were talking about how we need to understand what's better. Is it the speed at which amyloid is decreased that's important? Is it the eventual level that amyloid is decreased to? Or is it the amount of amyloid that's removed? So like the difference between how the amount of amyloid that somebody starts with compared to the amount that they the drug ends um, ends with. Um, because we're still seeing, they still see benefit in people that don't have complete amyloid removal. Um, so is amyloid complete removal the be all and end all? Um, and other questions they had was about the lag of amyloid removal with some people um, taking a, a while before the amyloid starts to come down um, and the dose and reaccumulation as well. And then the other question was more on um, biomarkers and whether biomarkers can predict one, who will benefit most from these drugs and two, who may suffer the side effects of amyloid related imaging abnormalities. Um, and whether biomass can help us to then alter treatment strategies um, for those people. And my, my whole day, people like everybody in various different talks have been saying that we, one, we won't be having one biomarker for everybody. It will be a panel of biomarkers and the, the treatments will be, it may end up that we're in a, a situation where treatments are more tailored to 
the individual as opposed to one size fits all, especially when we're talking about DLB with 50% of people having a different comorbidity. Um, and so um, I think... Well, yeah, because to also to throw in that controversy you mentioned there about about you can get different levels of amyloid removal and have different benefits. You can also have all amyloid rem removal and no benefits. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I mean, uh, and Ka I love Catherine Murray's talks because she's so honest and transparent about this. Well, she's, mm -hmm. I think she does an amazing job at balancing being positive, but also being very realistic about, about the potential benefit from these drugs. As somebody who's, you know, led clinical trials delivering these to people, she kn knows firsthand mm -hmm. how the... The, whether they're really beneficial or not and accepting that there's going to need to be more that an anti-amyloid therapy alone isn't going to fix everybody yeah. and i think that's one of the issues with pharma companies isn't it because they all want they'd all like to they're all businesses at the end of the day so the first thing they'll do is to try and jump on this to get their own anti-amyloid mm -hmm. um and then gradually work on improving the side effects that come from those and what you want them to do is to continue to explore other treatments as well mm -hmm. um, or vaccinations. I know we've seen we've had um, vaccination uh, talk with ADI last week from Vaccinity, which was fascinating. Um, sorry, I interrupted you. By all means, carry on. Um, yeah, so with the biomarkers, um, I think Rachel Doody from Roche was saying that they have an algorithm and a blood test that they're developing that they think can predict who will be at a high risk of aria which is really interesting because that could be um that could revolutionize the safety aspects of these drugs um and like the bad side effects um and, and other the companies... apo apoe was on that as well wasn't it that they needed yeah. to introduce apoe testing which they didn't routinely don't routinely do right now yeah um and because i think from the it was from the Denanamab trial by Eli Lilly, they showed that at least um, people with APOE4 had less, it was less effective for those people. And I think Lacanamab might have shown the same as well. So, yeah. Um, and I think they're more likely to get side effects when they rem Yeah. Yeah. APOE4s are more likely to get ARIA. But then there was the other study we talked about on day one, which said it can reduce APOE4. <laughs> 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 so you needed that as well as that and that's where this this whole thing about this com it'll be a combination of therapies rather yep. like how we deal with cancer these days you don't yes. just get one thing you get a a whole range of different uh different treatments which are personalized care like like you personally you were mentioned at the start there Ian. sorry we interrupt you for a second time do carry on <laughs> um i was just gonna say that so it won't like um I'm, I think I and everyone else is seeing a field where it's not going to be, we're going to get a better and better amyloid immunotherapy until that's, that's what we've got and that's doing the job. I think it will be with, a, with tau, um, perhaps a tau removing drug, maybe even something that targets neuroinflammation or like metabol metabolic changes or something as well. Um, the other thing I wonder is whether we're going to get further and further to slowing down the disease, um, that then we hope that it stops, but whether diagnosis will get better and better that we can see people in prodromal stages of the disease so that they never actually, and through like screening and things, if this is, it's maybe me like pipe dreaming here, but screening programs and things to at a certain age, just see people who have got a higher risk and then giving them drugs that will stop them actually having any memory and thinking problems in the first place. So Prevention was always going to be the, the main, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, yes, yeah, sure. You can make those that Helena talked to those lifestyle changes in middle age and then combine that with a very, very early biomarker of some kind that can then mean you could receive some form of treatment that would also prevent you getting it maybe. Um, that seems most likely at the moment, doesn't it? The way this is going, yeah. unless we suddenly all find out that there's one particular cause and that's it. It's easy. <laughs> gum I doubt disease. That. It so it's, it's yeah. gum disease <laughs> 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 causes. Thank you, uh, Ian. Um, and it must have been a busy week for because uh, you're at Alzheimer's side. It must have been a busy week for you as well with all the the press around the the news. So I imagine you've yeah. had a stressful week. <laughs> 
Yeah, Monday was particularly busy fielding, well, putting out the information for our supports and stuff and then fielding various requests and um, our team has just been, was just running around like crazy. Well, and all your team are off, off having fun in, in Amsterdam. Well, yeah. you're dealing with all the work back in, in London. <laughs> yeah, I'm just sweeping up back here in London. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. Uh, v, I'm going to come back to you for your next highlight. I just wanted to um, uh, touch upon the uh, vaccine that you were saying. I think it was um, today's talk as well, where I think his, um, the name was Dr. Pascal Gletzer, and he was talking about um, the shingles uh, vaccine, the herpes zoster vaccine, and how... He was, um, uh, so what he did was, I think it was like September 2nd, 1993. So everyone who took the vaccine before, uh, after that, and it was just a one week difference. And how that um, vaccine, and just like before that week and after that week um, is what they gave um, these participants. And they found out that it was preventative towards AD. And that was the, uh, he has a study, um, he, he was uh, talking about a study, so um, it is like, is AD, maybe there's a viral component to it? Because that's what they saw, like how does that one week, September 2nd, 1993, a thousand um, people before this week received it and the other uh, thousand didn't receive it and they, I guess, followed them and they saw the, um, uh, I guess, the um, benefits of that vaccination. So when you talked about that, yeah. It's interesting, and, isn't it? I mean, it's hard to replicate. Um, right, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you'd it, like it, to replicate that on a lot, much larger number of people, but then we'd have to wait another 30 years before we <laughs> see yeah. what happens. Sorry, on Saturday, I went to uh, the PIA, PIA day because it was my first time. And they, I went to the inflammation infection PIA and they spoke about the the they that particular group is quite convinced that the herpes zoster vaccine is protective against Alzheimer's, and several mechanisms are proposed. One of them is that it's not actually the zoster virus that that is the risk factor, but it's herpes simplex one reactivation that that has been found to significantly increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease, and if you and, and, you know, that reactivation occurs because of stress, lowered immunity, sun exposure, whatever. But having the shingle zoster vaccine has been found to, this was what was presented, stop react, stops reactivation of herpes simplex. So it's via herpes, reduction in herpes simplex that the herpes zoster vaccine works. Ian, as our, yeah. as our official science communications person, uh, not officially from Alzheimer's. So what would you make of that? This story comes to you. You're at Alzheimer's side. Yeah. What? It's in the news tomorrow. What are you going to make of it? What are you going to say? What, when when the Daily Mail or whoever it is says herpes, they pick up on this tomorrow. Causes yeah. Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> no, herpes <laughs> vaccine can prevent Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. Do um, we don't routine. So nobody routinely gets vaccinated against herpes, do they? Not, oh, not in, in the UK. In Australia, anyway. it's highly recommended that. Um, yeah, that that in later life you get the zoster vaccine. Is this is this one of the vaccines that's only really been applied in the UK in the last few years, and they're giving it to younger people now? Um, there's been a few in that space, hasn't there? No, am I imagining that? Oh, the chickenpox vaccine's been around for ages. I know we don't use children. We don't give that in the UK either. Oh, we do <laughs> in Australia, and then no. later in life you'll get the zoster vaccine. Right. So we don't routinely vaccinate for herpes in the UK. Okay. Interesting. Um, I don't think so, do we? I wonder if countries where they do routinely vaccinate would have lower... Because if this plays out on a much bigger scale, True. countries where they routinely vaccinate should have lower levels of Alzheimer's disease, in theory. They should. Now, there's they? a good study. Mm-hmm. Anyone interested um, can, in researching that? I can feel a funding call going out from the Alzheimer's <laughs> Society. Look, it's, look, can you see his brain working away right there now? <laughs> that's an easy fix. If that really is the case, what an easy fix. Finding a country where that's been routinely used, though, uh, on a large scale, mm. I 
think would be interesting. Wow, thank you, V. You've caused our controversial one of the day. I, but I like it. I mean, that sounds brilliant. If right. that's uh, that's got lots of potential. Can you remember who? Sorry, remind me again. I think you said at the start who Doc, presented uh, that. He's uh, he's from Stanford University, Doctor Pascal Gletzer, G E L D S E T Z E R. So go look that one up. I know I'm going to be. Did you have another one to add? Um, yes. Yeah, so then I, um, like I said, I was doing caregiver. Like I felt like I was going through like a, uh, a like uh, like in a museum. So first time, first it was the science, and then it was the biomarkers, then it was the drug development, and now I'm like today was a caregivers and public health. So there was a. Um, so this session was like a lightning session, um, and it was lightning presentation, and it was public health. And there, they, um, uh, I forgot her name, but she was looking at the life after 90 cohort. cohort. So we usually, um, you know, when we think of AD, we only probably hit 90, but this is like 90 plus. So they were looking at a cohort of um, ethnically diverse population and how um, how um, their cognitive uh, like uh, cognitive decline how fast it is after that age and what they found was um, white per participants had significantly greater decline in executive functioning um, and then followed by Asian participants and uh, executive functioning scores among black participants and participants who identified as the other had very similar as uh, Latino participants. So what it is is the disparities in cognitive aging after 90 didn't mirror the disparities seen in the younger elderly groups. That's interesting too. Who? Sorry, who was that? Who? Um, that was. I'm just looking. Um, I, that was by Claire Munoz from University of California, Davis, and she was a session presenter under the Lightning Presentation Round for today for Public Health. Brilliant. Thank you, V. Um, I'm going to go back to to you, Helena. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to give you. Um, I'm going to give you and Ian uh, one more chance to pick up anything or give you all one more chance to pick up on one more thing um, before we wrap up today. So why don't you give us your next? Okay. Um, I was really interested in sex and gender specific risk factors for cognitive decline and neurodegeneration. Um, and there were a lot of talks within that topic. The ones that stood out um, was the sex dependent effects of air pollution on longitudinal changes in CSF and plasma biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. That one was presented by Natalia Villor Teodor, PhD, from Barcelona Brain Research Centre. Um, she looked at 195 middle aged, cognitively unimpaired people. Uh, she measured their CSF amyloid beta 42-40 ratio and CSF phosphorylated tau, both at baseline and then at follow-up. And basically, they found she found that high levels of, of exposure to air pollution as measured by particulate matter 2.5, that indicates the size, and nitrogen dioxide. The higher those levels, the greater the reduction in plasma, amyloid beta 42 and 40. But here's the thing women are much more sensitive to air pollution than men. Um, there was also effects on interleukin-6, pro-inflammatory cytokine, and similar effects on plasma NFL, especially as levels of nitrogen dioxide increased, and it was particularly significant in women. That was then followed by, so, so yeah, we can speculate on the mechanisms, but they weren't offered. Then um, Matt Noseworthy, who is a PhD student from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, looked at whether biological sex moderates the association of residential nature exposure with brain volume. And the basis for that was, you know, favourable associations have been found between green spaces and brain structure, and green spaces reduce dementia risk. So what he looked at was um, they defined exposure as having a natural environment, um, the percentage within a thousand metres of a person's home, so how much green space you had. And nature exposure, it's just phenomenal. And I think that's partly through to, um, due to various phytoncides, which are chemicals released by plants that, that 
help regulate our immune system and various things like that. But basically, the more green space, the greater your total grey and white matter, the greater your total grey and white matter volume, um, and the greater your average hippocampal volume. So get out there. But here's this is this is the unfairness of it all. Men benefited more from living closer to green spaces than women. And from the previous study, you would have thought the opposite because men and women are more sensitive to air pollution. You would have hoped that they would benefit more from having green spaces around them, but they didn't. I mean, both sexes benefited, but men benefited more. And the argument was maybe that if you live in a green space, maybe women still spend more time indoors, perhaps. Maybe men tend to exercise more outdoors, perhaps, so they did try and control for all that. But there was a good news story that came out of gender differences. And this was um, looking at the vascular system and things that mitigated, mitigated um, cardiovascular risk on Alzheimer's disease. Cheer for this one. Women benefited more from aerobic exercise than men in terms of executive function and as measured by their ADS COG score and Stroop test. So finally, finally, we come to something that benefits women more than men. Um, yeah, and so if you do that outside, even better. Even <laughs> better indeed. Um, and, and apparently, uh, not apparently, well, this study found that only females have an increase in brain-derived neurotrophic factor after six months of training. Men didn't seem to have that increase. And we, we love BDNF. It's a fertiliser for brain cells that stimulates the growth of, uh, you know, neurogenesis, synaptogenesis, um, it promotes learning, neuroplasticity. So we all want more BDNF. So my take home from that was I will really, really encourage, I mean, I always have, but now even more so, make the case for women to go out and exercise because you will benefit even more than men if you go out and move. And I did ask the question, why do we think women benefit more from, cognitively more from physical exercise than men? They don't, they didn't really have an answer, but my specula but one one speculation was when women go out and exercise they tend to do it in a more social way they tend to join classes so they're not just getting physical benefit but they're also getting social benefit yeah whereas men might just go out for a run or something Although, or micro, but i don't know that that's necessarily the case no I mean, I mean, and it's great that this is being looked at. I think this is one mm. of the fantastic areas about dementia at the moment because because there are so many factors that are still in play because we haven't fully decided on exactly what causes it, what prevents it and things, which means it's, we they kind of throw out this really wide net uh, of of research that, that really captures and encompasses everything. And I love that that's the case. Although, of course, you could argue as well that that's, that's not necessarily spending the money in all the right ways. But I, I love that, that, and that's important. But the point about being, um, if women spent more time inside than outside, you'd imagine that when they lived in polluting areas, they'd be more advantaged because they'd be inside, not outside. That's true. Um, but remember this study, oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's true too. Yeah. Fascinating. I mean, yeah. I could we could chat about that for ages anyway, because I just, yes. um, uh, particularly on the pollution side of things, because there was, I think I saw several talks at the AIC last year and at ADPD that talked about particulate levels, and I learned so mm. much from that that yes. talk than things I hadn't thought about at all. Yeah. Well, one more quick thing, I, I want to make the point. I think one of the benefits, one of the reasons women benefit more from physical exercise than men is they start probably at a lower baseline and they have less muscle mass. And I think even just aerobic exercises helps to increase muscle mass in women. And we now know that grips, hand grip strength, the lower your hand grip strength, the lower your cognition and the greater you, the, your risk of cognitive de decline in Alzheimer's. So that strength training is really, really important. And if you start doing any form of exercise, you're going to improve your strength. And I think that might be a reason that women benefit more. So it'd be interesting to see then more of that work carried out in places where we know that there is higher prevalence right now, because of course the mm. issue with those studies is that they're all often carried out in kind of wealthy and middle class populations of people in, yes. in these parts of the world where you want to see that happening in in more diverse populations and to look at those sex and gender differences in sub-Saharan Africa where we know that um, there is a higher incidence or prevalence rates right now but where um, and women and men fill different roles 
traditionally yes. they do different jobs they have different activities and pollution levels are variable so it'd be interesting to see that same work replicated in other parts of the world in india maybe or in mm. in south america thank you helena um yeah. ian have you got uh, uh, ian and v have you got one more um, just to add on to uh, Dr. Helena's, if you were, uh, you know, that whole green space study, um, someone did present, I think, earlier, uh, where she did a prospective study on th 350,000 participants. And what she did was she put them, the green space, into quartiles, like quartile one, two, three, and four. And the fourth had the largest green space. And so the fourth quartile had a 10.9% uh, lower risk of Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Than the first one, which was three point two. Yeah, um, I wasn't that. That was, I think, yeah, yesterday or the day before. Yeah, brilliant. So aerobic exercise and go live in the countryside. Mm, right. Yeah, <laughs> we'd all like that, Ian. Um, I'm going to bring it all the way back to biomarks again. Um, so one of the big questions I have, and yeah. that we're thinking about Alzheimer's society as well, is that whether in somebody's dementia diagnosis and or Alzheimer's disease diagnosis journey, with the improvement of blood-based biomarkers, whether that would be a suitable test to give somebody in replacement for another test that shows that they have amyloid or something in their brains. Um, I think often people don't have any sort of biomarker test at the moment. It would be a, um, a memory test and a structural brain scan and then if there's more uncertainty then they would be off of further tests oh and they're not even so, given the structural brain scan are they not routinely it's in the royal college routinely. guidance but not <laughs> routine even in the uk it's variable yeah and so with like we like the goal it seems that the gold standards or the best standards for diagnosing that somebody has amyloid in their brains for example is to give them a pet scan or a csf test and one of the questions I have is with these blood based biomarkers, I know that the idea is that before I've heard that the idea could be that somebody has a blood test that suggests that they might have elevated levels of amyloid or tau that suggests that they might have Alzheimer's disease to then take have another test like a CSF test or a PET scan um, to confirm it, which is problematic because for PET scans, at least in the UK, there's just not the infrastructure to be giving everybody that has dement that may have dementia or may have Alzheimer's disease a PET scan. Um, and CSF tests, I think, compared to other countries in Europe, at least, I know that the UK is more squeamish about testing CSF and the general population, whereas I think it was the Netherlands, I heard, that it's very routinely done that people in the Netherlands get lumbar punctures for various things. So there was a talk by a guy called Sebastian Palmqvist, from Lund University, um, and he was talking through a um, a sort of blood test that combines tau, phosphorylated tau two one seven and the A B to forty two forty ratio. Um, but the interesting thing about his talk was that he was looking at the people who then ended up having amyloid in their brains by a PET scan and didn't, and the overlap and seeing like which tests showed that um, like was discriminatory discriminatory and from that he proposed having a sort of three-tiered level of testing so they would you do a give people a blood test and then they'd either not show that they have amyloid in their blood they would have a low probability that they have alzheimer's disease so you perhaps would watch them or you'd follow them up and then there was a group who it was quite distinguishable that the people that had this it was called precivity ad2 the blood test um that were positive for this then did have Alzheimer's disease and the overlap was very small. So rather than having a black and white blood test, it would be more of a, maybe a, I know in diabetes, there's the idea of seeing that somebody has pre-diabetes before they are then diagnosed with diabetes. And it may be that the same sort of thing can happen in the UK. That that was on their press release as well, wasn't it? But they called that and then they used this am amyloid positivity score, probability score, mm. yeah. the AP, APS2 apparently. Um, and then in the questions, because that was in the same session as Henrik Zetterberg, in all of the questions, people were like, there was asking about um, whether they could be used, the blood test could be used alone just to diagnose Alzheimer's disease without further tests. And um, I think from the panel, at least, the general consensus was yes, but taking extra care and to say, um, to add caveats to the certainty of the test, 
and perhaps in this three tier um, diagnosis system of um, the blood test, the people with the low probability might have a second blood, second test, whereas the people that had the high probability of having amyloid in their brains, it would be distinguished that they did have Alzheimer's disease. I, th I think it would certainly help with this challenge. We know that um, talking to psychiatrists right now that there's this there's this particular ch challenge where the public health messages that have come out of the likes of the Department of Health, the NHS, Alzheimer's Society, telling people to don't wait. As soon as you think you've got a problem, go to your doctors. And the problem is, is that then they get referred on to a memory clinic and the sensitivity of the test we're using right now just, just mean that the doctor just doesn't know. They're slightly reluctant perhaps to give somebody a diagnosis and say, oh, you've got Alzheimer's disease because that's a pretty bad diagnosis to give somebody. So they might say they have mild cognitive impairment or they might say, just go away. We're not sure. Come back and if things get worse. I think I like the idea of potentially using that as a tool to address those don't know people where if you could give them a, uh, give them a blood test at that point and then schedule in perhaps over the course of the next year quarterly blood tests like you do in cancer you know you watch and wait we'll come back for another scan in three months but come back for another blood test in three months and do another one so you can see what's happening with amyloid or tau levels to make a decision to help inform that decision as to what how do you proceed and, and I think that would potentially at least address this awkward limbo that so many people find themselves in which is either getting told you've got a disease that you don't actually have or getting told we're just not sure you've got a memory problem come back later um, or being put on a medication that they don't need or not getting treated for something else that they could be getting treated for I, I think it, it's got a real potential power in that space but that, that's just my views I'm not a clinician it was interesting that you were saying about the tools that the current uh, clinicians have to uh, make these diagnoses, because in that talk, he did compare, I don't know what tools they were using, but he did compare the current diagnostics from him and then some of his colleagues, they tried to diagnose based on the information they already had. And they found with the this new blood test, it was 82% accurate at diagnosing Alzheimer's disease whereas just their current the sort of the current tests alone was only 54.8 percent accurate which he even alluded to the fact that that's not very much better than just flipping a coin and saying no. and it was distinguishing Alzheimer's from non-Alzheimer's disease um, but he was saying that clinicians know they know that the tools aren't good enough and there's a bit of but that brings it back to that, that usual thing. I mean, I've got a background in NHS service improvement and change management, and that brings us back to this old problem that even if we know we've got something better, actually implementing that in a healthcare system is a challenging issue. I mean, first of all, getting everybody to agree on what is a good digital cognitive test, for example, or which biomarkers to use, or what's the process for this, but then actually taking what we know is there available now and actually getting it out there and making it work is so frustrating and takes way longer than it needs to, yeah. to do. These things are there now, let's just crack on, make use of them. Um, but uh, the NHS is an amazing organisation, it's brilliant for that, but it, it's also bureaucratic i think and you can't suddenly crack on and some lone physician somewhere decide that they're going to do something differently um it doesn't work like that i think it does slightly more in australia i think you've got more potential for that in australia and if you've got the money you can certainly do that in the u.s i think that's enough with that that's it we're way over i do you know what i was determined to make this podcast 40 minutes and here we are at one hour f one hour in and that uh, before we edit I, you've all been amazing and the reason why this is so long because you've all had such amazing talks and you've talked about them so passionately as well uh, and that's really come soon thank you so much all thank of you, you for thank you uh, one, for, one yeah, for, for, can i just say you don't have to record this one for you um i think it was the first first podcast um you had a you had a little fun chat about omega threes one of the one of the guests said, oh, no. you know, you're going to tell me off now, it. aren't you? No, I'm not going to tell you <laughs> off. I'm going to tell you about a really interesting poster. It wasn't a presentation. Um, Hussein Yassina. And basically, he's looking at the effect of APOE on lipid metabolism. And he found that 
ApoE4 carriers, with age, their response to omega-3 fatty acids gets less and less. The, on a population studies, yes, the more fish, the higher their DHA diet is on population studies, the better their cognition tends to be. Supplementation is really controversial. But, but with, with ApoE4 carriers, they've got to get their omega-3s in early in life because once they sort of get past middle age and once they have any cognitive de decline, omega-3s are no good. So if you're, ApoE4... Which spells doom for people like me who was a, a child of the 70s who was brought up on everything in my house was beige. I ate a lot of beige food during the, during the 70s an ApoE, and 80s. <laughs> it's a, if you're not an ApoE4 carrier, you remain responsive to omega-3s. It's only if you're an ApoE4 carrier that you lose your responsiveness to and I think that's the good question about omega threes, isn't it? Because the chances are, if you're having a, a good, filled omega three diet, the chances are you've probably got a pretty good diet anyway, rather mm, than somebody true. who doesn't. So you're gonna offset that that risk factor where we know diet is important. It's, in, it's up there in that list of Lancet modifiable risk yeah. factors. Uh, shameless plug, I was just going to say that's uh, nutrition, metabolism, dementia. He was the past chair, Doctor Hussein, right? That was the yes. FRS. That was our FRS. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. That yeah, yeah, he's wonderful. He's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. So that all those talks are available to watch back on the platform for mm -hmm. the next few. Certainly, I think if you're an iStart member, you get it for slightly longer. But so these the are all available. Of August, I think. Um, available for you to go back and watch on the platform. I think you do have to have registered by now, so you you can't kind of register after the conference closes. But um, I think. To up until today, tomorrow will be your last chance to register and still watch everything. But once the conference is finished, you can't register retrospectively. So do go away and um, catch up on some of the talks we've we've mentioned. As we said, there are over 800 orals, uh, six or 8,000 posters. Um, so we haven't been able to talk about everything we'd like to, but I think we've had a bloody good go at it today, if I'm honest. Um, Thank you to my brilliant, brilliant guests, uh, V. Melandra, Dr. Ian Hartnell, and Dr. Helena Popovic. Uh, you've been amazing. Thank you so much. You're all welcome to come back on the show. Uh, and we'll be back. Our next, I think, conference highlight show will be from probably from Alzheimer Europe later this year. Um, you can find profiles on myself and all my brilliant guests and information on the conference shared by attendees on Twitter using hashtag AIC23 and, of course, on our website at dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk. The podcast will be taking a two-short week break uh, just to allow you all to catch up on the shows that you've missed over the last couple of weeks. But we'll be back on the 7th of August talking about reshaping misfolded enzymes. And if you just can't get enough, we also have a separate podcast called Ask Your Mentor, which will be having the last in that uh, podcast's 10 episode run with Aitana Sorgwog. That will be coming out next week. Uh, so if you have a look for Ask Your Mentor, there's 10 brilliant uh, podcasts there. The nine at the moment, 10 from next week where you can listen to uh, mentees interviewing their mentors, talking about their careers and how they've changed over time and some top career tips from some amazing researchers in that series. Um, my last plea, because I wrote a blog on this for this week, is however you, if you've been attending the conference in person this week, I'd encourage you to consider offsetting your carbon footprint from that. I know carbon footprints are often a little bit controversial as to whether they're beneficial or not, but if you find the right program through one of the gold standard frameworks, it's really worthwhile and not necessarily as expensive as you'd think. And it's a great way to set an example to other conferences. I think in-person conferences are so important, but do take a look at that and just have a give some consideration to potentially offsetting your carbon. As we've heard today, air pollution is important. The world is warming up and we can all play our part to contribute to reducing that. Thank you very much, everybody again, Helena, Ian, V. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. I'm Adam Smith, and you've been listening to the Dementia Researcher Podcast. The Dementia Researcher Podcast was brought to you by University College London with generous funding from the UK National Institute for Health Research, Alzheimer's Research UK, Alzheimer's Society, Alzheimer's Association, and Race Against Dementia. Please subscribe, leave us a review, and register on our website for full access to all our great resources. 
dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk.